So our, our speaker this week is Sakura schaefer nameki from Oxford, um, and she'll be talking about 5D SCFTs, symmetries and moduli spaces. Thanks for joining us. Right, thank you very much. First of all, thanks very much for the invitation to speak at the Western Hemisphere seminars, and I'm very happy to be here. Let me just set up all the screens. I have the chat window in front of me as well. So can you see the iPad screen? Um, and can you see this pointer? Yes, we can. Excellent. Okay. So I will try to monitor the questions through the chat, but if I miss one, um, please do tell me to do. Okay. So thanks very much. I'm going to speak about 5D superconform field theories, uh, in particular focusing on symmetries and moduli spaces of these theories. Um, this is work that has appeared in a series of papers, some of them BC, some of them DC, sort of categorized by when, when they happened, uh, you know, between when Corona happened and during. Uh, most of the papers I will actually focus on today are these listed below. So this is work in uh, collaboration with my student Julius Eckhart and postdoc Gina and Wang in Oxford, as well as a paper with Dave Morrison and Brian Willard. And something that appeared last week with Cyril Closet and Yunnan Wang, also both from Oxford. And maybe a little hint of something that's work in progress, again, with my two students, Marie Ken Julius and Antoine Bourget, who's a postdoc at Imperial College. So there are, of course, nowadays, you know, when online seminars available. Um, and I spoke at the Italian seminar uh, in May on the paper with Dave and Brian, and Cyril talked last Friday at Tring Mass. Um, so there'll be some overlap, but I'll try to be complementary. So the talk will not be too uh, overlapping with any of these uh, seminars that are available. Okay, and please do ask questions. So let's get started. Um, so the topic today are five D super control field theories. Um, if you sort of look into what there are in five dimensions, are gauge theories, of course. But if you write down sort of a standard gauge theory term, a trace F squared term, and you look at dimensions, not four or lower, but actually five or higher, uh, then you'll notice quickly that actually the gauge coupling G squared has mass dimension that's negative. So in fact, all the interactions that you have are relevant at long distances in the IR. So then a naive expectation from that simple observation is that these should be probably boring theories. So there are no interacting CFTs in the IR. But there's actually lots of evidence to the contrary. Namely, these CFTs in 5D and also in 6D live in the UV, so a strong coupling um, of these theories. So in fact, we should think of five-dimensional gauge theories just as effective theories. Um, they live on some extended Coulomb branch. I'll explain what the Coulomb branch is in more detail. And basically, there's a lot of evidence that at the strong coupling point, uh, we should find some interesting uh, superconform field theories. And the evidence for this is really tied very strict, strongly to uh, string theory, because string theory or M theory allows you to actually interpolate between the gauge theory description and also the strong coupling. So it can access this point that you can't access using just perturbative methods. So just to set the scene, what actually are we talking about? What's sort of the basic structure of these five D and one gauge theories? So we said there are really IR descriptions of subconform field theories in the UV. They have a gauge group, G gauge, these IR descriptions, and they have some global symmetries. So these are, uh, in the IR, some flavor symmetries. If you have some SU engaged group with some matter, they can have global symmetries. And then there's this additional U1 topological symmetry here. And together in the UV, they can enhance to some UV flavor symmetry that's very often strictly larger than just the product of the IR and the UV, uh, and IR and the U1T. So there are two types of representations um, that are important. So the vector multiplet in the adjoint of the gauge group, and there's a scalar field in that, phi, and the hypermultiplets, um, which are in some representation of the gauge and flavor symmetries, and it's comprised of scalars and fermions. 
And then associated to these scalars, there are two types of two distinct moduli spaces, the Coulomb branch where we turn on webs for phi and possibly also masses for hypermultiplets. So that's what's usually referred to as the extended Coulomb branch. And then there's a Higgs branch, which is that's for the hypermultiplets. There are also mixed branches, but what I'll do today is just talk about the Coulomb branch and its branch separately. So it's always good to have an example in mind. And of course, in five dimensions, so the prime examples are the rank one Seiberg theories. So here we have the gauge group SU2 and some NF fundamental hypermultiplets. And you get superconform field theories for NF equals to zero and so seven. Classically, an SU2, which you really should think of as P1 uh, with NF flavors, has an SO2 NF flavor symmetry. But what was shown in the work by Cyberg and also Morris and Cyberg is that enhances at the fixed point to ENF plus one. So for the NF equals to seven, it's an E8 flavor symmetry, and E7, E6, et cetera. And you can in fact go from one to the other by essentially decoupling one of these uh, hypermultiplets. So sending the mass of that to infinity. So in this case, the masses the, of these hypermultiplets and the scalars together make up this extended Coulomb branch of these vacuum expectation values phi and the masses. So this is a nice class of theories and then they'll return in various guises later on. Um, because they illustrate many important uh, features. So I made the point that very much at the beginning that these series you cannot really start study just looking at the IR field theories. And so really a useful way to think about them is just in terms of defining them in M theory. So it's M theory on a particular non-compact Calabial threefold or canonical singularity times R14. And X here can be either an isolated or a non-isolated canonical singularity. So in the singular regime, so when I'm not doing anything to the singularity, um, that's modeling the superconform field theory. And then if I look at resolutions, if I look at the Kähler cone right here, that corresponds exactly to this extended Coulomb branch. So these parameters phi and MF that I was talking about before. And then there's of course the complex structure deformations that can deform these singularities and that'll correspond to the Higgs branch. Now, since this initial work by Seiberg and Morrison, um, there's been a lot of work on this and there's sort of, I think, uh, Oren Bergman, I think called it the second wave. There's been sort of another sort of a wave coming in the last few years with a lot of progress, understanding these more systematically in the context of M theory. Uh, compactifications and the properties such as the symmetries, the moduli spaces, and to understand, in fact, uh, really the whole class of them, and perhaps even classifying these series. So I'm just listing papers that have appeared here, uh, sort of in bulk, and refer to more in detail later. What we'll focus on today is let's understand what we can learn from the Coulomb branch description using geometric methods from the Higgs branch, and then also what sort of symmetries, how they realized. And there'll be these global symmetries, these zero form symmetries, but also um, as I'll explain, there's the so-called higher form symmetries in these 5D SCFTs. Okay, are there any questions so far? This was sort of background setting the scene. Uh, is there anything? That... I think we're good. We're good, okay. So what is the Coulomb branch? We'll start with the Coulomb branch, which is the best understood. I said it's essentially modeled by the resolutions of canonical singularities. They can either be such that you can fully resolve the singularity or there could be some terminal singularities that are in that. And we'll talk about them very much at the end again. Um, the gauge symmetry is essentially modeled in terms of the exceptional divisors from this blow up here. So there'll be some compact surfaces and the number of them essentially uh, determines the rank of the superconform field theory. So if you have uh, the fully resolved model, there'll be rank many um, compact divisors. The global symmetry, so the zero form, the flavor symmetry will be non-compact divisors. Um, F here is the flavor rank. 
And we can characterize F in terms of being the number B2 of X tilde is just R plus F. So all the two cycles, um, uh, both from the compact and non-compact divisors. They can, in, ad in addition, be also free hypermultiplets. So if one of these compact surfaces is ruled over genus G curve, then in fact, you have a non trivial B3 for this resolved space, and that can contribute B3 over two free hypermultiplets, in addition to some non trivial gauge theory with some matter. Okay. And the dynamics on the Coulomb branch, it's very well known from the work of interligator Marcin and Seiberg, is determined by the prepotential. That's the function of these Coulomb branch vets, phi i, i equals one non to r. And it has a classical piece and one loop piece that, that also depends on uh, not just uh, the phi, but also these masses for hypermultiplet matter. And the prepotential uh, determines the effective Lagrangian. So by taking these derivatives, the second and third derivatives, we can write down this effective Lagrangian and the, that fully fixes uh, the dynamics on this Coulomb branch. And now the key relation to the geometry is, so this is a purely field theoretic sort of statement that in fact, if you realize one of these 5D theories in terms of some Calabial geometry X tilde, then you can calculate this prepotential just from the triple intersection numbers of the compact divisors. In fact, you can also generate these terms by computing mixed compact and non-compact divisor intersections on the Calabial. Okay, so how actually are we now getting interesting gauge dynamics here? Well, the Raptam two brains on rational curves provide both W bosons as well as matter hypermultiplets. So if I have a curve, a rational curve in normal bundle minus two comma zero, then that contributes W bosons. And if the normal bundle degrees minus one minus one, these are the matter hypermultiplets. And so in this way, I can sort of see what type of um, theory, so you give me Calabial, I can resolve it. I can determine what type of effective theory uh, I should be getting. And of course, the mo most important aspect here is the super conform field theory is obtained by now shrinking the volume of the compact divisors FA back to zero. And so this volume is really setting one of the gauge coupling squared, and that drives you to strong back up uh, to strong coupling. So that's just essentially 5D gauge theory, super conform field theories in a nutshell. Now there are many ways you could study this sort of system, many geometric tools. And I'll briefly uh, discuss sort of the advantages, disadvantages, the scope of these methods. Um, there, there's actually a question. Um, yeah, Dave was uh, wondering about other degrees. Uh, so I think you studied that. Um, yeah. So you can have minus three comma one curves. Yeah. Um, so I know that, for example, in, in F theory, these can appear in fibers in the higher co dimension. Um, so yeah, I don't know what here. I have not encountered them appear yet, but I think you studied them perhaps with Andres and flops related to them. Yeah, I mean, the, the fact that they occur on Calabia threefolds has been known for 30 or 40 years. Yeah. We made some preliminary uh, discussion about a year ago about yeah. what they would mean in physics. But mm -hmm. uh, if you're classifying what can you wrap M2 brains on, it's important to not exclude those. Yeah. So in fact, what was interpretation of those in the field theory? Uh, higher U1 charge, uh -huh. rational curves. In elliptic models, I guess. Uh, it, it, it should have a higher elliptic models. So Fabio says they can be instant on particles with respect to gauge theory description um, if they're in the base, but they could also be in the fiber if it's an elliptic model. Yeah, that's right. So I, I think it can also be. Uh, uh, so would you say you want to charge? A, a, anyway, I think there's room for a more systematic explanation. Absolutely. Of the yes. And, yeah. and they, they shouldn't be overlooked. Absolutely. And actually, in all this, what I said at the very beginning, this is something we noticed also, um, when I started talking about the resolutions, um, so far I haven't really told you anything about if you have residual terminal singularities, uh, what is the interpretation for that? 
And so that's something that also I think hasn't really been studied. And we now in this paper from last week, we explored that uh, to some extent. So we have some ideas what this corresponds to. So indeed there are many things that certainly uh, require a bit more systematic analysis. But this is so the basic when you have a gauge theory, uh, what you would have to uh, study. Anyway, so are there any other questions? Andres has a question. In any case, they are fully obstructed, so they should correspond to matter fields. Okay. So let me now go and discuss what are the possible geometric tools or what have we studied so far um, in terms of realizing by the SCFTs. Of course, the toric models, the elliptic models that come essentially from uh, the F theory, study of F theory compactifications to 60 and then circle reductions. There's also the approach that Sheldon and collaborators have looked at, which is characterize the collapsible surfaces directly. And then there's sort of a way of just addressing if you have an isolated hypersurface singularity, what type of models can you generate in this way? So in, all of these are in, in a way subsets of the full set of possible uh, models. So just a brief overview of what we can learn from each of these approaches. So there's the set of toric columns. We understand everything in those, the Cool Coulomb branch, the Higgs branch, also all the symmetries, but it's a limited class of models. Um, the elliptic models, so as I said, those are the ones where you study the elliptic vibration first in F theory, and then you do MF duality to six dimensions from six to five D. And those we understand essentially completely from the Coulomb branch, but because most of these singularities are not isolated, and we have very little understanding of the Higgs branch. And then there are, of course, in this case, the symmetries can be fully controlled because thanks to the non-isolated nature of these singularities, uh, the flavor symmetry, for example, is manifest. And in fact, this is probably the largest class of models because essentially uh, they all descend from 60 uh, by uh, circle reduction and mass deformations. And I think most models that we know will fall into this class. From the collapsible surfaces, there's full understanding of the Coulomb branch and some of the symmetries, but it doesn't actually construct this Calabiao geometry. Um, so it's not, I think you cannot really understand Higgs branch in that context. And what I'll, we'll see is in this IHS, so the uh, isolated hypersurfaces, uh, we'll be able to understand both Coulomb and Higgs branches, the symmetries, and then we'll see that this is a sort of peculiar class of models, which sort of cut perpendicular to all the, these other ones. There'll be models that we've seen in here and here uh, and, and here, but there'll also be models that are totally new. And so that's something I'll describe today. And then there's a completely different approach where you say, um, I'm not realizing in terms of M theory and Calabial, but I actually am realizing five uh, CFTs using so-called five brain webs. That's not always directly geometric, and in this approach, you can access Coulomb branch, Higgs branch, symmetries, and um, there's probably after the elliptic Calabial, the largest class of theories. So there's still some models that you can access from these elliptic models, but uh, the, the brain webs, I think, don't realize like the E66 can form matter descendants. But essentially, uh, that, that's a very rich class of theories. And one advantage, as we'll see, is that you can actually really understand the Higgs branch in this case. Okay, so let's start just to warm up um, with some toric example to set sort of the scene, just understanding what type of models we're looking at. So just a brief recap. So we have a toric color BL threefold. Um, it's characterized by a fan, which is essentially a set of cones in a 3D lattice. And the 1D cones, which are uh, essentially vectors V, the X, V, Y, V, Z, are corresponding to the divisors. And the third coordinate VZ can always be brought to be one. So in fact, what we're looking at is just um, points in the XY plane and they form a convex polygon. And the extra internal uh, vertices in this lattice are the compact divisors and the external ones are the non-compact divisors. So in their uh, flavor rank plus three, many non-compact divisors. The 2D cones are the complete intersection curves and the 3D cones are the triple intersection numbers. So this 
once you have a toy color BL, all the data for this 5D theory can be read off. So again, one nice example is the E1 cyborg theory. So that's SU2 at uh, level zero or SP1 at level theta angle zero. The toric geometry for that has the following um, vertices. So these are these four, four points here. If I don't further resolve this, so I don't put any internal lines, this is the singular CFT. And I can partially resolve this and actually putting in this curve here, I still have one of the P1, so, so this is P1 times P1. Um, one of these curves is still collapsed. So I actually get a curve of SU2 singularities. So this is the non abelian gauge here description. And then the fully resolved geometry uh, is then the generic Coulomb branch point for these series. Okay, so that's a very simple rank one example. There are more interesting, more richer theories which one can discuss. In fact, any toric uh, geometry can be studied in this way. Uh, one nice example is the TN theory, which is just C3 mod ZN times ZN. So the toric polygon is determined in terms of these three uh, vertices. So this triangle at 0, 0, 0, N, and 0. And in this case, N equals to 5. So all of these green vertices are the non-compact divisors and the red vertices here. These are the compact divisors for this rank six theory. Now, what actually do we want to read off from such a diagram? We can read off uh, the prepotential and so on, but what I'm interested in is in particular the symmetries of these series. And we said that these series can have say non-abelian enhanced flavor symmetries in the UV. So let's talk about these symmetries for, for a bit. So they, they're in the gauge through description. They have some global symmetries. There are some IR fla uh, flavor symmetry times U on topological, which is generated by this current star trace F by Jeff. So classically, we have, for example, for an SUN gauge group with NF flavors, some UNF uh, flavor symmetry, or for SPN, that's the SO2NF. And then at the UV fixed point, this enhances. So one way of encoding what this enhancement is, is in fact to write down a graphical depiction of what are these curves that will actually contribute to the flavor symmetry and which of these curves will actually contribute to being hypermultiplex. And this is what's encoded into this so-called combined fiber diagram. So this is a graph and it's made out of the rational curves in this geometry, which are intersections of the non-compact divisors with the reducible surface, which is the sum of all the compact divisors. So in general, this is a reducible curve. We can still calculate what is the normal bundle to this curve. And this can either be minus two zero or minus one minus one, or it can be higher. It can actually in this case also be minus one and, and so on. But if it is minus two zero, then in this graph, it'll contribute to what's called the, the marked vertices. And those are the ones which will determine the flavor symmetry in the UV. And if it's minus one minus one, those will be the hypermultiplex. And they'll transform in precisely the way indicated by where these minus one minus one curves intersect, these minus two curves will transform in that representation of the UV flavor symmetry. So let's look at that for this TN example. So I'm, I drew here, essentially for each compact divisor, for example, here, I drew what surface it is. So for example, this here is a DP3, there's another DP3 in here and so on. And we can calculate what are these uh, self intersection numbers of these curves. So for example, in this case here, um, it'll be the sum of these two compact divisors intersected with that non-compact divisor that will make up this uh, reducible curve and it's a minus two zero curve. And then translating that into just this diagram of these marked and unmarked curves, we get these sort of, this, this boundary diagram here. And so this is what this combined fiber diagram in this case would be. And you can read off from the marked subgraphs here, the flavor symmetry, which in this case is uh, SU5 cubed or more generally SUN cubed. And What's also nice here is that these minus one curves, those are the hypermultiplets. So they transform in these bifundamentals of these uh, flavor symmetry groups. So 
under each pairwise group here. And now we can do flop transitions. For example, I can flop this curve here, flop this into this, and that means I'm decoupling that matter multiply. And in this way, actually, you can determine now for a given theory, all the descendants and all the flavor symmetries, essentially in a completely uh, you know, algorithmic way. So that's essentially by having these CFDs, we can read off the UE flavor symmetry and the whole decoupling tree and the flavor symmetry for each of these theories. And that's not just applicable in these simple toric models, but also in this large class of theories, uh, these elliptic models. So these global symmetries are, oh, there's a question. What's the relation between these 5D TN and CFTs and the 42? So there you, you do a circle reduction of these. So uh, we'll, I'll actually talk about the 5D to 4D reductions and, and the relation between 5D and CFTs and so on in, in a moment. Um, so indeed, okay. this, these are much better known in 4D as just the Trinian theories, right? The sphere with three punctures, and you have uh, just a regular puncture with SUN flavor symmetry. And so that, those are exactly the theories you get um, first going to in 5D, and you can reduce them uh, to four dimensions. Thanks. So in addition to zero form symmetries or global uh, flavor symmetries, as, as you usually refer to them, there are also higher form symmetries. And these were first in, oops, introduced first in this paper by Toyota Kapusta and Cyber Bullard. Um, and the idea is a very natural one. We, we should think of zero form symmetries, so ordinary symmetries, just as uh, symmetries where the charged operators are point like. And we can measure the charge by surrounding them with a D minus one dimensional sphere and integrating the charge density of that. So just that, of course, Q should not be here, so Q here. So a Q form symmetry, the charged operators are now just Q dimensional objects and we have a topological surface operator of co-dimension uh, Q plus one that surrounds it. And that's essentially uh, the definition of what this higher form symmetry is. And in five dimensional superconform field theories uh, in a few recent papers, uh, it was noted that these theories can have uh, non-trivial one-form symmetries, and also what we noted in this paper last week, that they can also have uh, so higher uh, form symmetries of uh, Q equals to three. So in a standard gauge theory, so if we all say on the Coulomb branch, and then a gauge theory description, uh, for example, can have a one-form symmetry. If say we have a simply connected gauge group, it has a center Z, and then the electric one-form symmetry is just uh, given in terms of the center Z. And then the charged operators are just the Wilson loops in some representation R, and they transform as under this gamma, under this one form symmetry in the same way as R transforms under the center. If pi one of G is non-trivial, so let's call this gamma M, so this is sort of the magnetic um, dual, so to speak, then we have a two form magnetic symmetry. And in fact, we can pass from one to the other by essentially gauging uh, this higher form symmetry. So an example is SUN, we have a center, which is ZN, or PSUN, and then we don't have a center, but then gamma M uh, is ZN. And that's the two-form symmetry. In this case, it's the one-form symmetry. So that's so the simplest example that is essentially um, what you would see in the pure gauge theory in five dimensions as well. So how would we characterize such higher form symmetries from the geometry? Um, in M theory on some singularity X, uh, we also should think of so the singularity as being this non-compact six dimensional space. And then the boundary of that is some five manifold. So if there's a color DL, then this be some Sasaki Einstein manifold. And then the one form symmetry, we should think of as essentially um, non-compact two cycles so M2 brains wrapping non-compact two cycles, modulo screening by M2 brains wrapping compact two cycles. So this is essentially uh, this quotient H2 of the relative homology modulo H2 of X. So H2 of X would be the compact two cycles. So those are just M2 brains wrapping compact two cycles. The finite mass particles, but what we're interested in here are 
these in two brains on these non compact two cycles, modular screening. So these line operators in the five dimensional theory. And so this group here determines the one form symmetry. And that also we can think of if you don't have any torsion uh, in, 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 in X, this also can be thought of as H1 of the boundary of X. And more generally, if you have a Q form symmetry, uh, then we have an electric or magnetic Q form symmetry, depending on whether these operators will come from M2 or M5 brains. And they're determined in terms of some relative homologies, but it's always the torsion of that. Actually here, I should also write torsion because it's just a torsion part of that. That's all right. So here, what essentially is going on is this HK torsion can contribute to the electric three minus Q and K is three minus Q form symmetry and the magnetic six minus Q form symmetry. So concretely, what we would have in 5D are the following interesting groups. So for the electric symmetries, it's the zero and the one form symmetries. And for the magnetic ones from the three and the four cycles, uh, the two and the three form symmetry. And we'll see examples um, for Q equals to one. And also later at the end of this talk um, for the three form symmetry in these isolated uh, hypersurface singularity cases. But let's first look at these one form symmetries. So if I'm given some uh, singularity x, I can cut or I can resolve it and then compute this quantity here. So here really should be writing uh, the resolution of this. Um, I can calculate now the one form symmetry simply from the H2, this quotient of the relative homology modulo H2 of x in this way, rewriting this in terms of the intersection numbers. This essentially is the quotient Z to the B4 mod some matrix, which is the intersection matrix of compact two cycles and compact curves and um, times the lattice Z to B2. And so essentially from that data um, of the intersections of compact surfaces and curves, we can then determine what the one form symmetry is. Oh, did the slides freeze? Did the slides freeze? I, I, think, we're, I think we're okay. Are they moving? Yeah. Okay. So in the toric case, um, this simplifies further. So this intersection can rewrite that even in a simpler way. In fact, then the one form symmetry is simply given in terms of Z to the F plus three, modulo the image of the matrix um, that's made out of the external vertices of the toric diagram. And so the one form symmetry is then just computed from taking this matrix here and computing the Smith normal form, and it gives them possibly three torsion factors uh, for the one form symmetry. So concretely, let's look at this theory that we already looked at before, the SU2 level zero with these following vertices here. And the one form symmetry is computed by this Smith normal form, which is given here. So this one form symmetry is Z2. So that's consistent, that's just the center. There's no matter. And uh, we're looking at level zero. So for SUN level K, we would have a diagram like this. And in that case, the same calculation gives that it's the Z of the GCD of N, C, and uh, the uh, transcendence level of that theory. So that's also consistent with the gauge theoretic description. And then finally, of course, the so all these computations can be done in the resolution because what goes into this initially is here, the compact surfaces and compact curves. Um, what you see in this description of the toric models, however, is it only depends really on the um, external vertices. So not on an actual internal triangulation. So the expectation is that this also will be true for the um, theory in the UV. So this is also the higher form symmetry, one form symmetry for the uh, fixed point. And another point to make is that this also can be calculated for theories that don't have Lagrangian descriptions. So for example, at rank one, if we further decouple our matter at the very bottom of this decoupling tree, there is this P2 theory. So where the surface, so this S is just P2. This has no ruling, right? It's just a triangle and there's no ruling for the surface. And in that case, 
uh, this calculation gives uh, that this is a Z31 form symmetry. The question, why does the one positive force produce high form symmetry? Uh, so the other part will, uh, uh, so, so for example, in fact, here, the non-torsion part will contribute to the flavor symmetry. Um, right, so that, that also there'll be some Z to the flavor. And I don't wanna uh, have that contribute to this particular um, group. Right, so I'm only interested in the uh, torsion part of this uh, group. Okay, so this brings me to the end of the discussion of the Coulomb branch. Um, a lot of that uh, really relies on having some gauge shear description that may not be unique, this gauge shear description, right? So there can be different types of rulings or different types of degenerations that give different gauge shear description for a given UV fixed point. Um, the Coulomb branch gives access to the symmetries, the flavor symmetries, also these decoupling trees, and also the higher form symmetries. So the Coulomb branch is a very nice, happy place to be in and very well understood at this point. Now, what is much more tricky in 5D is the Higgs branch. And so I wanted to get to that. So actually, now that Ted has this up here. I, I think we're good. Okay. So the Higgs branch is a hypercalar cone for 5D supercontrolled field series. And we'll refer to this dimension, the quaternionic dimension is dh. And unlike the Coulomb branch, um, it's not just purely geometry, it has some quantum corrections, which come from and two instantons wrapping uh, some compact three cycles. So geometrically, the realization of the Higgs branch arises by deforming a given singularity x. So I'll denote that by x hat. And to study that in the geometry, um, you could look at two geometric frameworks. One is the isolated toric cases. And then there's this case that we'll discuss in more detail, which is the hypersurface, the isolated hypersurface singularities. There's, as I mentioned at the very beginning, a com totally complementary approach, um, which in some instances will overlap with the isolated torics, but in general is sort of quite distinct. And that uses these brain webs. And uh, there's been recent progress on understanding the Higgs branch of the five DSCFTs by constructing an object called the magnetic river. And the magnetic river is essentially a quiver gauge theory. Um, you can think of it as a three dimensional n equals four quiver gauge theory. And this theory whose the Coulomb branch of the theory uh, is identified with Higgs branch. So I want to briefly discuss this because it essentially motivated the looking at sort of a more geometric approach to these magnetic rivers. Um, and since there's been a lot of work and some exciting progress there, I just want to briefly discuss this. So let me give you an interlude um, on these brain webs or topical geometry. Um, so this is work uh, with, from Ani Hanani and his group at Imperial. So I'll start with X a toric or generalized toric. Generalized toric here for those who are initiated in this or these um, uh, toric diagrams where I also allow certain vertices not to be populated. So these are these dot diagrams introduced by Benini, Benenuti, and Tachikawa. But you can also just think of it in terms of toric diagrams. So there's a dual graph, which is the so-called brain web. So it's some um, five brain web. Um, w of x, and I won't have to go into any detail what exactly that is, but the conjecture by Cabrera, Hanani, and Yagi is that there exists a 3D n equals 4 quiver gauge theory, and I'll denote this by MQ5, associated to this brain web, and it's determined essentially by looking at all the sub webs that are irreducible and defining an intersection of them, such that the Coulomb branch of that magnetic river is the Higgs branch of the 5D SCFT. And so the quantum corrections on this side here are under control using this uh, monopole formula by Cremonese, Hamani, and Safaroni. And then a natural question is, of course, can one sort of reverse this? 
can you sort of take this part out of the equation and just directly in the geometry formulate how you would derive this magnetic river. So the question is, what is MQ5 in terms of X? If X is strictly convex, so like this theory we looked at before, V1 theory, as it's P1 times P1, and then there is in the math literature, um, the so-called Altman algorithm, where you can study the deformations of the singularity using what's called the Minkowski sum decomposition of the toric polygon. And from that, one can then translate that into the deformations of this geometry. Um, a slightly more physics motivated, sort of a, let's just see what we get approach is what we pursued in a paper that we're about to finish, which is we can also simply take the rules from the brain web and translate them into these polygons and ask what are the rules that then compute the magnetic river. And so what I want to briefly tell you is just an example in the simplest sort of setup of a strictly uh, convex toric polygon, how that would work. And so what the appetite, what kind of sort of things one could then perhaps uh, try to do to uh, prove that more rigorously uh, from the geometry. So let's look at an isolated toric color BL. And what we'd like to do is determine a uh, quiver theory. Uh, so a graph with vertices with some labels and the labels tell us the ranks of the U or the UNC and C of these gauge groups and some connections between them. So the algorithm essentially says take the polygon and determine a Minkowski sum decomposition. So what it means is uh, the decompositions, I give an example here, uh, take these, so you have these points here and now just take the sum of all these points together and that gives you exactly this polygon here. But we're not taking just one of them, but we take all possible inequivalent Minkowski sum decompositions. So this one is one, right? I can start with this. I can add on that and get this, this square, and then I can add on to the square uh, the, this diagonal and I get the full diagram. And likewise, I can do, take these two triangles and add them together. And that also gives this E3 toric diagram. And now the algorithm says to each Minkowski summon, associate a color. So I color the edges. So in, for example, in this case, this decomposition induces an edge coloring like so from this decomposition here. And then I propagate that edge coloring into the diagram in such a way that the full polygon gets tiled by either triangles of a single color or bicolored polygons, uh, bicolored parallelograms where the two colors are always on you know, the parallel edges. And so in this case, we've achieved that here and here. And then the rule continues that we can then to each color associate a single node in the magnetic quiver, which has a uh, label one. So this corresponds to U1 node in the quiver. And then what we need to know then is how many edges connect each of these vertices. And that's given in terms of in the, what in this uh, sort of tropical geometry is called the mixed volume. And that's in fact, just the area of the bicolored parallelograms. So we had in this case here, a bicolored parallelogram. This was uh, two light blue and uh, greens and that has area one. This is area one, one, one. So what I'm getting here is exactly this diagram here. And then from this decomposition over here, there's two, of these parallelograms that are bicolor, the volume is then two. So I'm getting this diagram here. So that in this strictly toric case is an extremely simple um, rule to derive the magnetic river. So the E3 theory is precisely, so E3 here is uh, basically uh, the SU2 with flavors, right? Um, and indeed that Higgs branch is uh, given in terms of the a2 plus A1 minimum the potent orbits, and those are exactly the magnetic river for these guys. So this gives a way for any uh, strictly toric diagram to derive what the magnetic river is. And the nice thing is, of course, uh, I here to explain this in sort of a few minutes, I just had to 
specialized to these isolated toy guys, but in fact, this algorithm using the results from the brain webs, you can translate that into any toric, not necessarily strictly, but also um, so-called generalized toric, so these dot diagram polygons. So this gives a way of deriving, given the polygon, the magnetic river, and thereby using these methods by um, Cremonesi, Hanani, and Zaffaroni, also then what the um, Higgs band looks like. So the open question here is, of course, how do you actually derive these rules directly from the deformation theory of the initial geometry X, right, from this, from this toric polygon here. In this case, there's sort of this Altman algorithm, but more generally, this is um, quite an open question. So I won't go into more details about this. I'm happy to answer more questions about this particular point. Um, what I want to discuss is, in the last 10 or so, 13 or so minutes, is this work that uh, where we have a sort of concrete way of going from the geometry to a magnetic river, um, which is using this uh, class of geometries, which are the isolated hypersurface singularities. And this um, was came out in a paper with Cyril Close and Yinan Wang last week. And here we don't sort of start with um, any toric geometry, but we completely switch gears and look, look at hypersurfaces in C3. And so we're looking at some polynomial and the three coordinates x1 until x4 vanishing. For this to be a canonical isolated hypersurface singularity, it has to satisfy a certain uh, criterion. And those were essentially all classified these types of hypersurface singularities by Yao and Yu. And the first one is that F has to be quasi homogeneous. So if I scale the Xi by lambda Q to the I, QI being some rational numbers, um, then positive rational numbers, then F scales was just lambda. They're singular at an isolated point. And they're canonical if these QI satisfy that the sum of the QI is bigger than one. Or put differently, if you prefer a sort of more CFT point of view, C hat, sum one minus two QI is less than two. And with these conditions, Yao and Yu came up with 19 different families of such isolated hypersurface singularities, uh, although there are many redundancies in this, these, um, uh, in this description. So what you'd like to do is understand for this class of geometries, what is the Higgs branch? What are the deformations of these and how can we extract uh, the Higgs branch uh, from that? So the deformations of such a singularity is characterized by the Milner ring. So that's just the ring, the polynomial ring uh, over C modulo the derivatives of F. And that's finitely generated for an IFS and it's of dimension given by this molar number mu. So I can write down the deformation in terms of the original polynomial and then some monomials. And here, this is sort of bold face, some product of the XIs with some powers. And that's exactly uh, the deformations that appear in this memory. So by deforming the space, I change the third homology. So in fact, there's Z to the mu uh, three cycles in this new geometry. And to actually characterize the different uh, three cycles, it's useful to introduce the spectral number, LL. So that's just QL, it's this combination here, which depends both on these QIs and these powers ML. And what's important is now these uh, spectral numbers, essentially when L, depending on what these are, they give a, a decomposition of H3 in terms of uh, the uh, either H12, so this is for L less than one, and I'll denote the rank of that group by R hat. L equals to one will be the H2, this is how it appears here, this is F, and then L bigger than one is again H21 is again R hat. And so what we'd like to know is how can we extract from this geometric data uh, the dimension of the Higgs branch, and that was discussed already in a paper many, many years ago by Gukov, Hoff, and Witten, and that's characterized by all the uh, dynamical hypermultiplets and the 
come from LL less than or equal to one. So the dimension of the Higgs band is dH, which is R hat plus F. And F here my, well, is the same as the flavor rank in um, a lot of the models. I can discuss some subtleties uh, later if, you, if you'd like. So this the flavor rank you can think of essentially it's the same contribution is coming from these um, divisors that were giving rise to the flavor symmetry by doing conifold transitions um, on this. So we now know the Higgs branch is determined in terms of this uh, data is R head plus F. What we'd like to know is a bit more structure, like on the level of what actually is the Higgs branch, you know, what's a hypercalar cone structure. And to do that, what we propose is, so one option is of course to use brain maps, another is to actually use dualities. And so what we propose is actually consider a chain of dualities and in that way identify um, essentially an analog of the magnetic river uh, constructed from this geometric approach. So the proposal was, well, we consider the theory to type 2B string theory on the same canonical singularity X. And that is by just supersymmetry, uh, the, 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 the dramatic properties of this, uh, this being canonical singularity gives you a 40 equals two superconformal field theory. And I'll denote this by this math script uh, T40 of X. So we have uh, the T, D of X and this T math call for D of X. And what we're doing is actually, so it's actually here. Uh, what you're doing is we compactify both of these series to three dimensions. And those are now 3D N equals four theories. They're just the KK theories uh, on a T2 or a circle. And then these two theories, as we look at these as superconform field theories, these are actually related by mirror symmetry or by T duality which is realized in this case, uh, is realized in, in this case, the 3D mirror symmetry. Now as 3D n equals four theories, they also have their own 3D mirrors. So if I denote this EQ5D, these are 3D quivers, these are electric quivers, um, and denote by the, by the mirrors by MQ, so these are the magnetic quivers. And likewise, the circle reduction of the EQ for D, sorry, the, the circuit reduction of the 4D theory is the EQ4D and the mirror of that uh, is the MQ4D. Then our conjecture is that the five, the magnetic quiver of the 5D theory can be computed from the electric quiver of the 4D theory by gauging a U1 to the flavor, F flavor rank. And likewise, there's a statement for the magnetic river of the 40 theory. So since this is there a lot of MQs and EQs and 4D and 5D, I've been sort of draw this in a, in a graph. So we start in M theory, put that on X, that gives a five dimensional theory. We put it on T2, that gives the EQ5 theory. And what we're interested in is this MQ5. That's related by mirror symmetry to EQ5. In 2B, on the other hand, we have this mass script X 4D theory. Put on a circle, we get the EQ4D, three dimensional theory, whose mirror is the MQ4. And the claim is we can go from this theory by gauging by U1 to the F flavor symmetry to the magnetic river. And of course, the nice thing is determining this theory may be tricky. Determining this theory is in fact, right? For example, if there's a Lagrangian SCFT, we can just do our dimensional reduction of that theory. Okay, so this is just some, let me just skip this. Um, so from this conjecture, we essentially have this identified this magnetic quiver and um, Kanani was telling us we shouldn't call this a quiver because it's not always a quiver. Gauge theory, it could be some non-Lagrangian theory. So we actually thought we will, should call it a quiverine uh, in case it's not a quiver. So with the quivers and quiverines, but in the end, these are just the, the 3D reductions of the SCFTs and 5D. And in the cases when these are Lagrangian theories, they should exactly agree with the magnetic rivers obtained from the brain maps for the associated theories. And so the, from the geometric point of view, what we found is now the Higgs branch of this 5D SCFT should then be the Coulomb branch of this 3D n equals four theory, MQ5D. And that can be computed from the electric 
quiver E240 by division E1 to the F. Um, and another nice ob observation, of course, here is that the, right, I was saying the, the Higgs branch has quantum correction from two incentons. So this problem, you'll say, still is there. But in fact, in this context, this has been studied in this paper uh, by Kermanis, Yanani, Safaroni. And so we can use the results to then infer uh, what Higgs branch in 5D should be. So the strategy is we consider the 40 SCFT, which is typed to be on the same canonical singularity. From that, we can compute the electric quiver, in particular, if that's, say, a Lagrangian SCFT. And then from there, we can compute uh, from the deformations, the Coulomb branch, the spectrum of the Coulomb branch operators. Those are determined just in terms of the singularity by this standard uh, sort of dramatic engineering in 4D. And then we have to still gauge this U1 to the F symmetry. And that should then give rise to the magnetic quiver five. So let's actually see this working in the last couple of minutes. So the first example is the E strings. Those are rank N generalizations of the EN cyber theories, um, N equals to six, seven, and eight. They all have a weakly coupled IR description in terms of an SPN gauge a theory with n minus one flavors and one antismetric. Resolving these singularities gives a flavor rank little n and a gauge rank capital N. And then the uh, dh dimension is just the Dulcoxon number n minus one. And then from the analysis before, we can determine r hat and d hat as follows. So let's look at now, how we determine from this, in these cases, we know what the magnetic quiver is, uh, but uh, let's derive it for the E6 case. So as known by the 40 SCFT engineering on this singularity by Katz, Meyer, Rafa, um, these have a gauge here description in terms of a product G, a quiver with uh, gauge groups S, U, D, K, N, where D, K are the thinking labels. And so this is the quiver that's drawn here, where now each of the nodes is an SUN or SU2N and so on. And indeed the spectrum for N equals to two, for example, is given in terms of uh, these uh, dimensions delta that come from the singularities. And going through this, we can identify it can be exactly each SUL we contribute um, delta L until two. So in fact, here, there's exactly one SU6 node, one SU, uh, right, so for n equals to two, so there's one SU6 sitting here, and then SU4 nodes, three of them, and then three SU2 um, nodes. And so the resulting um, quiver, for, this is the electric quiver, and by gauging now the U1 to the F, we get this U, D, K, and uh, magnetic quiver, which is, the correct magnetic curve for this uh, theory. So in given the time constraint, let me perhaps skip this. Can I have two minutes extra? Okay. Sure. So there is um, a rank two theory, which has flavor symmetry. It sort of illustrates a, an interesting point, how wildly, strangely arranged these uh, uh, isolated hypersurface singularities are. Um, so we had the E8 rank N theory here. Um, so this is sort of just a dimension reduction of the E string, the rank N E string. Now, if you look at the following theory, it has rank two and has flavor symmetry E8, that the hypersurface looks like this. By analyzing again, the scaling dimensions, we can see this has a quiver description in four dimensions with these gauge groups that matches the spectrum here. And putting that together gives the electric quiver where each of these is an SU node. So then gauging again this U1 to the eight gives now the UL node. So it's the same quiver, but each of the nodes is now gauged. The U1 has been gauged, so we get a UN quiver. And this has the Higgs branch, um, which in fact, in this case, we can determine the foliation. And it has sort of one E7 and O. Oh, Lots of questions, okay. Uh, well, I'll get to those, Michaela, in a moment. 
but let me finish the talk first. So we have two leaves in this, it's a rank two theory, there's an E7 and an E8 leaf. This just follows from this um, theory. We can resolve the theory and actually we find that this has a description in terms of an SU2, SU2 with five flavors and five dimensions. So this is a 5D um, IR description. Right, this has nothing to do with the 3D reverse. And this theory, in fact, um, indeed has flavor rank eight and has an E8 flavor symmetry. And what is interesting is that, in fact, this theory is a descendant of the rank two E string. Uh, so this theory that corresponded to the hypersurface, this one here with N equals to two. Um, once I decouple a hypermultiplet, I should be getting to this theory, which has the hypersurface singularity given by that. So this is uh, somewhat mysterious how these things are organized in the world of isolated hypersurface singularities. Okay, there's also something that we can derive from this, which is new, which is the magnetic quiver for the, uh, the singularity here. Um, that turns out after resolving it to be a G2 with five flavors. And that has actually a magnetic river in terms of uh, orthogonal and symplectic gauge groups. So this basically is a magnetic river that from the brain maps, for example, I think has not yet been uh, understood. And finally, just to leave you with some interesting puzzles. So when you study isolated hypersurface singularities, a lot of these will not actually admit fully resolved geometry. So there'll always be some remnant terminal singularities. This can either be that this, you can't resolve it at all. So you in fact have a rank zero theory or you have a higher rank theory and you cannot fully resolve it. There's still some remnant terminal singularity. So one way of interpreting that is um, if these uh, rank zero theories or some CFTs or if you want to call it some perhaps uh, hypermultiplets that have been gauged discreetly, then these higher rank theories that can be fully resolved are higher rank theories coupled to some rank zero theory. So these are somewhat mysterious objects. So one example is there's a close cousin of the E6 rank one theory, which is essentially almost the same as that singularity except that the power of one of these coordinates is higher. You can do the same resolution as in the six case. However, the result, resulting uh, resolved geometry still has a remnant singularity. So this is given in terms of uh, this hypersurface here in this local patch. Um, so this is still um, now a singularity and it's a terminal singularity, so you're stuck with it. In type 2b, in fact, this is a very nice geometry. It realizes the uh, Jerry Stuckless theory, A2, uh, D4. So this one here. So this theory in 5D has rank one, flavor rank zero, and Higgs branch dimension is 16. And it has a non trivial three form symmetry, rank Z5. If you want to just compute from the boundary of the uh, six manifold. So there's a question is this a rank one theory that is now? A new rank one theory. Um, is it the Z6 rank one theory coupled to a rank zero theory? So these are the things that I think from the physics are still very interesting to explore. Uh, what exactly are these terminal singularities in this context? So for example, this might signal that it is some kind of discrete gauging of these uh, rank one cyber theories. Okay, so let me summarize. Um, so five TSCFTs seem a perfect sort of setup where we can use geometric methods to inform ourselves about quantum field theories. And it's sort of one of the ways of accessing these theories um, that's essentially, these are strongly coupled theories. There are very other, few other ways of uh, understanding them. Uh, certainly perturbatively, you would not learn much about them uh, otherwise. Uh, to fully explore basic the moduli spaces, the many different geometric methods, string theoretic methods that we have to sort of pull from, resolutions, informations of the singularities, but also inspirations from brain maps and from dualities. There are a lot of key open questions that I'd like to sort of leave you with. One is the role of these rank zero theories that we discussed at the very end. 
There are, of course, mixed Coulomb Higgs branches. And then really one thing that I think is particularly interesting is that one understands some of these aspects very well from these brain webs or these generalized torque diagrams. So it'd be very exciting to understand this directly from the geometry. Okay, so let me leave you with these and let me answer all these questions. So thanks very much. I'm sorry for running over for 15 minutes. No problem. Thank you very much for the call. Um, so if anyone would like... Yes, maybe it's easy to ask the questions rather than me reading yeah. in the chat. So. Um, well, Cyril sort of um, replied to Michaela's question in the chat. Uh, so, um, so Michaela says, as far as I have understood so far, the magnetic rivers, this reading goes forward, it's Coulomb branch because Higgs branch is five guessing. It's understanding of why is that the case from this novel perspective? Uh, which novel perspective? So, uh, I explained this for the case of these from the from the this duality point of view. Are you asking from this toric point of view? I think you can maybe just unmute yourself. Yeah, we'll come with your, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, 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 the question so, was the question was precisely. Toric, if, if this uh, T-duality understanding gives a... Yeah, so the T-duality understanding gives you a direct way of identifying this uh, in this case. But I, I think in this toric case, where I just sort of telling you, translate the brain web construction to this toric diagram, uh, in, for the strictly toric case, right, the, you could map this to this Altman word, but more generally, this is indeed one of these open questions here. Yeah. And now the other question also, if I remember correctly, results by Ariane Friends, where there is a magnetic for the Higgs branded finite coupling. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And um, so you can also ask this question, what is the Higgs branch for the weakly coupled theories? They're different. And in fact, for example, for SUN with NF flavors, it doesn't depend on the, weak, the weakly coupled magnetic river. It doesn't depend on the transcendence level. So a lot of the data gets washed out there. Um, so here, what I was talking about is always the UV fixed point. In this toric story, you can of course map, right? If you, for example, wanted to calculate um, the magnetic river for this of the E3 theory, but now including some weakly coupled description, I don't know, um, put some triangulations in, then you could also do that. And you would have to color also the internal edges and do the Minkowski sum decomposition including that. So in that case, you have both both uh, possibilities that are included in this prescription. Absolutely. Okay. Sure. Because right, hey. the, the triangulation is essentially just as dual to you including, you resolving the brain web. Yes, 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 of course. Thank I, you. I have a, thanks, Michele. I, I had a few questions. I don't see any yes. hands raised. So if there are, uh, please just unmute yourself and go ahead. But um, in the meantime, uh, so from about 15 minutes ago, um, yes. you were doing compactifications to, to 3D and, and gauging these U1 flavor yeah. symmetries. Can, can you explain where that gauging comes from? Why, why yes. that's so, intuitively present? Yeah, that's a good question. That's I think this is conjectural at the moment. So one way of seeing is just purely in terms of um, here. So here I also noted down the dimensions of all these uh, spaces, yes. So you essentially, um, you see here, right? These are the Coulomb and Higgs branch dimensions in 3D. So for this theory, if you start in 5D, we have the rank R and then here we have the H, which is actually R hat plus F. And on the to B side, right, the Coulomb branch is of dimension R hat and R plus F. And now if you do the mirror symmetry, right, these two just exchange, Sure. of course. And now we want to identify this magnetic, this electric river with this magnetic river of the 5D theory. So obviously you have to gauge this you want symmetry. Well, so you are from making the dimensions actually, match, like, like why, yeah. Yeah. So um, one way of saying it is right. So the, there's a when you do this mirror symmetry. So right, all this is doing is we're basically using this mirror symmetry in that context. I think you also have to do this kind of S gauging, this one gauging. So this is essentially what this is realizing. But it feels, it feels a lot like an abelian mirror symmetry 
But it does, yes. yes. But so you're asking what is, is there perhaps some kind of generalization that you have to consider? Um, yes, so these are not just abelian um, gauge groups, right? So for example, here you have, all these are SUN uh, rivers. Uh, so, but indeed it is always some abelian gauging. I don't know whether perhaps Cicero was there too, maybe he has some other comments about this, but certainly this is conjecturally uh, what we're proposing. And indeed in all these examples, it seems to be giving the right description. Nahi had a question in the chat. Thanks. Yeah. Um, uh, mm -hmm. So Nahi asks, what, what happens to the, glo the various other global, global ah, yes. symmetries of the 5D theory in three dimensions? Yes, so the global symmetry, so this example is a good example here. Um, so from the magnetic quiver, uh, if you, for example, so this was the theory, which is, um, let me write it down here. This is just SU2, zero SU2, five flavors, and has GF equals to E8. So this is a descendant of one decoupling of the rank to E8 uh, theory. Um, when you look at the magnetic river, so this is the magnetic river for this theory, um, it can compute something called the Hasse diagram. This is a concept that uh, I think also was used in 6D, but then in 5D, uh, Ami and his collaborators uh, basically came up with a rule of extracting from uh, this magnetic river, the symplectic leaves and actually a partially ordered set, this Hasse diagram. And the global symmetry is always one of the, the bottom part of this uh, diagram. So in this case, you can always extract this as the bottom leaf of the, um, uh, this Hasse diagram. So in this case, this is the EA. So you can still obtain it as one of the leaves in this uh, decomposition of the Higgs branch in these uh, symplectic groups. So that's where you can still see the global symmetry. Um, uh, that's a zero form symmetry. Now, none of these had higher form symmetries. Um, so I actually, so usually the higher form symmetries you have a one form symmetry. Um, so the, the, you have also the, the, the three form symmetry, but the one form symmetry you will have when you essentially decoupled most of the flavors, or all of the flavor. Um, so then the magnetic river becomes usually trivial. So in that case, I don't think you see that on the Higgs branch uh, manifestly. Does this answer? In the explicit connected one from global symmetries. Does, does this answer your question, Nadi? So the, the global symmetry you can still see in the in this symplectic um, leaf of the. So shall we say to yourself? Explicit one. Yes. Do you want me to elaborate on that question? Or? I don't know. I, I thought, I just want to know whether this answered Nadi's question. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh -huh. So Shalvin's asking, so Shalvin asked, can you explicitly connect the one from global symmetries with the strings from a five brains wrapping compact surfaces? Okay, so um, the one form symmetry comes from M2s, um, wrapping, right, so the, these guys here, they're always, so H, K is relative, the K cycles. And so if you have um, the one form, the electric one form symmetry comes from the two cycles, and uncomp the relative two cycles. Um, so that's then two brains wrapping the non-compact two cycles uh, of the geometry. Uh, there is a corresponding, what I was saying, the dual or the, the magnetic version of that, you can have four cycles um, and then five brains wrapping. Those, those gives you the two form symmetry. And in fact, you can go between the discrete one form and the two form symmetry. Um, by, by just gauging this, right? So you can, for example, start with a theory that has a one form symmetry like this one, and then gauge this one form symmetry and get a theory with a two form symmetry. And so uh, you would connect um, these ones here 
and these ones here. So um, you wanted to wrap and five brains on compact. Yeah, so this is basically what you were referring to as the strings from M5 wrapping compact surfaces, right? Because these are exactly the compact surfaces and the non-compact surfaces, right? You, you don't want, you really, these are the relative, so these are um, H4, right? So these are the, so these are, I think, not quite the strings that perhaps you had in mind that come from collapsed surfaces. Does it answer your question? Oh, um, maybe not, but I think maybe we're talking different languages, so I'll ask you offline. Thank you. I, I mean, these are, the, the two form symmetry that's um, coming from the M5 is wrapping four cycles. Those are coming from non-compact four cycles. Mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm talking about the, the compact four cycles. Yeah, so I, yeah. I don't, so those just give you uh, strings. And for example, those are the strings that are uh, becoming mathless when you collapse the surfaces. So I don't think- Sorry, I'm, are... I'm confused about that. Mm -hmm. I thought that all the surfaces that, all the cycles that are compact would correspond to modes that are dynamical in your system. And therefore, That's right. So in fact, in this case, right, for the one form symmetry, the compact two cycles give you just finite mass particles. Those yeah. have nothing to do with the higher form symmetry. Right, good. The M2 brains wrapping the non-compact two cycles, modular the screening, so it's this quotient here that are the basically the Wilson lines, right? So the world lines of these guys are the Wilson lines, and that's what the one form symmetry is characterized by. So they're charged on this one form symmetry. But so you have to make sure that they cannot be screened by anything. That's right. And so the screening is exactly this quotient. Ah, okay. The screen is okay, the non-compact guys, <laughs> modulo the screening, which is the compact two okay. cycles. And so similarly, when you have uh, the, the case that children wanted to look at is the four cycles. So that, this is the M2s, this is the M5s, right? Because it's electric magnetic. So the M5 is wrapping non-compact four cycles, modular compact four cycles. This is this group H4. That's the magnetic two-form symmetry. Perfect, thank you. Thanks. Okay, any other questions? Thanks. Had one final perspective question is nothing else. Um, so, so at the beginning of the talk, I, I, mm -hmm. I think you said that um, the largest class yep. of 5D CFTs comes from elliptically fibered collabias. Um, yeah, so um, indeed, yep. Can, um, what, <laughs> and then at the end of the talk, you, talk, you discussed methods for using collabia geometry for producing these magnetic quivers. Yep. Um, can you, you just say again how those overlap? What, what constraints on right. the geometry does one need right. to apply? So here, the elliptic calabiaos, these are usually, so think of it as you have a base, there's a C2, and you have an elliptic fiber, and you have some you know, standard Kodaira fibers, you can have some matter. However, these are not isolated. Right, so in, in, in sort of F-theory language, they're non-compact divisors coming in. There are seven brains. And so you actually don't get an isolated singularity. In this case, these are isolated. And that's why the key difference between these two is the entry here and here. I can study the formations of these isolated singularities. Whereas if this is a non-isolated singularity, I can study the formations. Uh, so sorry, I want to make a comment on this point. So the sure, key point here is not about the isolatedness, uh, but oh, totally. yeah, yeah. Uh, but the starting point here is a non-minimal Rorschach model. We will have the so-called quantum dimension two four six uh, point yes. on the base. Absolutely. And then we are going to uh, use a particular resolution to get an actual non-flat yeah. uh, smooth club L three for instead of the euro. Of flat vibration. Right. But in what the resulting thing is, is, is then not an isolated singularity. Uh, it's not. <laughs> yeah, so well, for example, it has, it's exactly like this case here. 
that you have explicitly some non-compact divisors yeah, exactly. associated yeah. to these guys, right? So you, you don't have an isolate. It's like, this is C3 mod Zn times Zn. That's not an isolated singularity. And indeed, you see this from exactly this way of symmetry being manifest. Yeah, of course, in, the non, yeah, in a non-isolated case, it's more convenient. But I was just referring to the your you know, original story of the E-string where you only have a minus one curve without any oh, okay. yeah I was talking about this case so it's not a that's necessary true. condition yeah. yeah so this class of singularities just maybe to summarize you have these elliptic models and in F theory they realize the 61 comma zero SCFTs and maybe there is a classification at this point that's up for debate it's certainly the largest class we know, then you can compactify these. And then what Yina was saying is what we do, how to study now the 5D theories is we do these non-flat resolutions. The resulting 5D theories are, have, are modeled by compact divisors, but also non-compact divisors coming into the geometry. And this is actually key in order to understand all these flavor symmetries explicitly to extract the UV flavor symmetry, for example. But that also prevents us, at least to this point, to actually study the Higgs branch, right? Because it's sort of, you, you're looking at, it's a very, not a very clean deformation problem. There are overlaps in these. So for example, there are these E strings, you can realize them in terms of elliptic models and also in terms of um, isolated hypersurface singularities. And there are many different sort of identification between models. Some models are toric and elliptic and so on. There are some overlaps, but certainly the largest class of 5D SCFTs come from these elliptic models. In fact, some people might say you could classify all 5D theories by dimension reducing from 60 and mass deformations and perhaps twist. This class is a special sub, it sort of cuts through in a weird way you specify, I want it to be an isolated hypersurface. That allows me to then study the Higgs branch, but it's sort of a very eclectic mix of theories. You get some E strings, you get also some, like the rank, for example, is completely not correlated, at least in any way that we can see directly with uh, the structure of the hypersurface. Of course it is, because that tells you how many blowups you can do and sort of rank, but it's sort of, very implicit. And, um, but it is a nice class to actually study the expansion and also get these uh, rather interesting, curious rank zero theories. So there is some overlap, but each of these approaches gives you different things you can study more clearly in one framework and uh, better in others. So ideally you would have, of course, a combined structure that allows you to study everything uh, you know, in, in one framework, but at the moment we don't have that. So I think that may be on. Yes, thank question. you. Thank you very much. That, that's, that's very clarifying. Um, great. Well, um, let's all thank Sukura again, and um, thanks to everyone well, thank for, for coming. Um, thanks for the great thanks talk. For coming.